I now call to order the Society's 2,373rd meeting in the 146th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by John Grunsfeld. We'll begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2,372nd meeting and a brief recounting of the 35th meeting, which took place in 1872. We'll then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Before we begin, please join me in thanking the sponsors of the fall 2016 and spring 2017 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization, in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous donor who's asked to remain anonymous. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Rich Myers, a spacecraft engineer with Northrop Grumman, who com comes to PSW through a friend at NIST. He worked on Chandra and the JWST, and he is interested in astrophysics and aerospace engineering. Bridget Kane, a data scientist with Booz Allen Hamilton, who comes to PSW through friends and the lecture series and is interested in distributed artificial intelligence, generative adversarial networks, physical anthropology, and human factors in spaceflight. Franklin Bryan, a patent attorney who has attended lectures and is interested in quantum physics, space exploration, and nanotechnology. Bruce Murray, a statistician and program management analyst retired from the Department of Education who comes to PSW through Meetup and is interested in mathematics, operations, research, cosmology, and biology. Jessica Bahara, or Bahara, a Coast Guard flight officer who comes to PSW through our online videos with interests in physics, astronomy, and engineering. Edward Fernandez, senior auditor with the Inspector General of the Federal Reserve and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau who comes to PSW through Google, who is interested in artificial intelligence, space travel, genetic engineering, and the nature of time. And then there's tonight's speaker, but he is already a member of PSW, and his interests will certainly be obvious to you from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them all to the society. If any of our new members are here tonight, please see me to pick up your reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin, where you can learn something about the founders of the organization and why they chose to name it the Philosophical Society of Washington when, in modern parlance, a name with the word scientific would be much more descriptive of their goals and the society's goals now. How many new members are here? Excellent. So I won't have to carry these home. Please do see me afterwards and pick up your copy. The minutes of the previous meeting's lecture on medical errors, eliminating the third largest cause of death, which was given by Marty Macri, will now be read by recording secretary Preston Thomas. Better in your pocket. At the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. on January 20th, 2017, President Larry Milstein called the 2,372nd meeting of the Society to order at 8.06 p.m. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. President Milstein presented a summary of the 34th meeting of the Society held in 1872. The minutes of the previous meeting were read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, 
Martin A. Macri, the surgical director of the Multidisciplinary Pancreatitis Center at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and a professor of health policy and management at the Center for Global Health at the Johns Hopkins University. His lecture was titled, Eliminating the Third Largest Cause of Death. Dr. Macri began by suggesting that the major theme of the last five years of medicine has been rolling back recommendations made over the last several decades. Recommendations such as daily aspirin for everyone and mammograms starting at age 40 were found to cause more harm than good in most people. Appendicitis may be treatable using antibiotics alone in many cases, which could avoid what is currently one of the most common causes of surgery in the United States. Dr. Macri related the story of the assassination of President James Garfield in 1881, in which one Dr. Bliss, against the advice of other attending physicians with Civil War experience, performed seven operations on the president to remove the bullet. The president ultimately died of sepsis resulting from the surgeries, more than a decade after Joseph, Dr. Joseph Lister had introduced the techniques of antiseptic surgery, the principles of which were well known in America, including having been discussed four years earlier at the 118th meeting of this very society held in 1877, as recounted in the PSW Bulletin. Dr. Macri explained that President Garfield, along with many other patients, died of unwarranted medical variation, meaning the practice of medicine that did not conform to the theories or techniques broadly accepted in the field. Dr. Macri identified medical errors as the third largest cause of death in the United States. One major source of such errors is the unnecessary medical, medical care, including overprescribing and unnecessary procedures and tests. Dr. Macri related that some doctors estimate that 15 to 30 percent of medical care is not necessary and brings with it real financial and health costs. Dr. Macri turned to explaining what can be done about it. One approach has been to attempt to reduce the incidence of unwarranted medical variation by identifying objective metrics for comparing physicians' practice and feeding that information back to them. For instance, Mohs surgeries for the treatment of skin cancer involve repeatedly removing thin layers of tissue from around a cancer site until only cancer-free tissue remains. By analyzing the number of cuts, researchers identified the doctors that were cutting substantially wider or narrower than their colleagues. Dr. Macri noted that characterizing performance as below average triggers defensiveness and justifications. In contrast, telling people that they are an outlier creates very strong social pressure. By providing objective feedback, outliers can be encouraged to move back toward the consensus position. In the same vein, Dr. Macri explained that the simple intervention of the checklist has substantially reduced medical complications by helping ensure that scientific advances and best practices make the transition into everyday practice. Another avenue toward improvement has been harnessing the cost incentive. Dr. Macri explained that one effect of the high cost of deductibles has been to drive patients to inquire more closely about the financial and health costs of tests and procedures. Dr. Macri noted that the system of networks and discounts has the effect of obfuscating the true cost of health care to the extent that even doctors do not know the cost to the patient of most procedures. Dr. Macri described the goal as a competent marketplace in which transparent financial and health costs are available to patients so that they can make informed decisions and market pressures can act to bring prices down. Dr. Macri concluded by explaining that health care is a complicated political and polarizing topic but improving medical care through reducing errors is uncontroversial and has wide benefits. After the conclusion of the talk, President Milstein invited questions from the audience. One questioner asked about the extent to which defensive medicine drives unnecessary medical care. Dr. Macri confirmed that the fear of malpractice was a primary driving factor of unnecessary care, but that overall it was only one of many factors contributing to the high cost of health care. Another questioner asked what changes in the medical school curriculum might help new doctors better consider these issues. Dr. Macri observed that current medical students already show less tolerance for dogma and theorized that the increasing diversity of the field may be driving productive inquiries into the validity of longstanding conventional wisdom as well as promoting transparency with patients. Another questioner asked about the reference ranges for blood tests. Dr. Macri agreed that individuals or groups commonly have results outside the reference range that are nonetheless normal and healthy for them. 
he reiterated the advice to treat the patient, not the test. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.45 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,372nd meeting of the society to the social hour. Temperature, 8C. Weather, foggy. Attendance, 43. Respectfully submitted, Preston Thomas, Recording Secretary. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Well, I'm not up to that because I'm going to add something. <clears throat> I think it should be noted for the record that that meeting was held on January 20th, which was Inauguration Day. And for that reason, our attendance was lower than it usually is. I will add that to the minutes. We won't, we won't speculate on why. It might have been lower, but it was. So with that, uh, if there are no other comments or corrections, I will entertain a motion, Mob, to approve a second of the member. All members in favor? Aye. Aye. All members opposed? Minutes are accepted unanimously and will be posted to the website in due course. The 35th meeting of the Society was held on Saturday. November 30th, 1872. President Joseph Henry was in the chair. The bulletin does not report the time of day the meeting was called to order or the location. Joseph Henry was a primary founder of PSW and its longest serving president, leading the organization from 1871 until his untimely death in 1878. He was the preeminent American physicist of his time, known internationally for his pioneering work on electricity and magnetism, particularly his work on induction that led to the invention of the telegraph and the telephone. Among other important roles, Henry served as the founding and first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. The meeting was taken up in its entirety, so far as we can tell, by William Tecumseh Sherman's account of his sojourn in Turkey and the Caucasus. Sherman, of course, was the northern general of the Civil War whose march across the south from west to east was an important campaign in the north's ultimate victory and visited considerable damage in the south outside the zones of actual battle. Sherman was to some extent forged as a general by his experience in the Battle of Shiloh, up to that time the bloodiest battle in American history where he was taken by surprise because he disregarded the reports of his scouts. He was wounded several times and lost several horses from under him before the battle was over, but he was never taken by surprise again. His visit to Turkey at the Caucasus was part of a tour of Europe and North Africa, upon which he had departed in mid-November 1871. The trip was at least partly motivated by his differences with the Secretary of War at that time. It was to have taken a year and a half, but in the event, it was only nine months long. Of course, I'd like to spend nine months in Europe myself, but we don't know why he chose to talk only about Turkey and the Caucasus at this meeting, and the bulletin doesn't tell us what he said. But from the United States, he landed at Cadiz in Spain, having been diverted there from the planned landing at Gibraltar by heavy seas and gale force winds. <coughs> And after touring many of the major cities in Spain and spending time in Gibraltar, he wrote that he agreed with Mark Twain. You can see thousands of saints sculptured and pictured, but no plain mortal who has done some act of historic merit like Columbus. After touring the French Riviera, he went to Italy, where he met Pope Pius IX, now remembered for proclaiming the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary and for presiding over the affirmation of the doctrine of papal infallibility as to faith and morals by the Vatican Council of 1870. While in Italy, he also observed a special excavation at Pompeii, and he climbed Mount Vesuvius. He traveled to Egypt, climbed the Great Pyramid of Cheops, visited Constantinople, which he deemed very likely the best site in the world for a great city. 
He met the Tsar in Russia, visited Austria, returned to France, and then visited Great Britain before returning to the United States. He was well known to Europeans from extensive newspaper reporting on the American Civil War, and he was well received everywhere except Germany for reasons that I won't go into here. He was back in the US by mid-September 1872, and his report at this meeting of the PSW must have taken place within a few weeks of his return. We could turn from the 35th meeting in 1872 to the 2,373rd meeting taking place tonight and <clears throat> to tonight's lecture on after the James Webb Space Telescope in space assembly of very large space-based observatories. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, John Grunsfeld. John is recently retired from the position <laughs> of Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Director at NASA. Previously, he was Deputy Director of the Space Telescope Science Institute and Professor of Physics at Johns Hopkins. John was an astronaut before joining SDSI. He made five space shuttle flights, visited the Hubble three times, performed eight spacewalks to service and upgrade the observatory. In all, he logged more than 58 days in space and more than 58 and a half hours of EGA time on his eight spacewalks. He has done research on high energy astrophysics, cosmic ray physics, and exoplanets, and has focused considerable effort on future astronomical instrumentation. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, the NASA Exceptional Service Medal, the National Space Club Engineer Award, the Komarov Diploma, and the Korolov Diploma. He earned his BS in physics from MIT, and his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture, and join me in welcoming John to the podium. I think it was last fall that Larry asked if I'd come and uh, give a uh, talk. I had talked about the Hubble Space Telescope and some, you know, some other things on previous uh, lectures. And at the time, my assumption was that you know, the pool of potential speakers must be getting very thin to be invited back so soon. And at the time, I thought, well, sure, I'll give a talk about you know, what do we do after the James Webb Space Telescope uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is I'm passionate that we continue this amazing quest of astronomy. And two, I don't really know what we're going to do, so it's easy to come up with you know, some kind of talk uh, that you know, may or may not reflect a real future. Um, but along the way, uh, you know, it's become ever more obvious that there is a story to be told and a story that we're sort of midway between. So what I thought I would do tonight is kind of tell you, you know, where we came from, where we are, and where we might be going. And it really starts with, you know, what are the big scientific questions that we're trying to answer? And what are those noises that go thump in the night? But, <laughs> You know, it really starts with, you know, where did we come from? You know, that's what people want to know. Where are we going? And are we alone in the universe? And so these are actually scientific questions uh, that we can answer and that have been part of the quest of astronomy, science, philosophy, uh, since, you know, people basically became conscious. And so I wanted to start with Galileo's telescope. Uh, this is a replica of Galileo's telescope, which we actually took aboard uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis with us in May of 2009. It was made with leather from the same uh, herd of cows, of course, descendants, that uh, Galileo used, and the same techniques of the time, and the same grove of trees for the wood, and the same glass factory that polished the lenses. Uh, and so it's a pretty fair representation of what Galileo had. And we actually used this on orbit. That's the Hubble Space Telescope in the background. And all I can tell you about Galileo is, he must have been an incredibly patient observer, because that was one lousy telescope. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it was transformative, because it gave us uh, the first view of the heavens in greater detail than what we could see with our naked eyes. And so this is, talk is going to have a combination of technical uh, you know, pictures and data. Uh, this is year of observation, starting with Galileo, 1600 time frame, uh, and we'll get up to the present. And this is a logarithmic scale of the factors of improvement over the human eye. And so this is 100 times more powerful than the human eye, 10,000, a million, 
100 million, uh, 10 billion. And what Galileo's telescope did was give us you know, something like 100 times more powerful than the human eye. And that was transformative at the time. And of course, that led to a slow and steady increase in the size of the telescopes. Uh, size does matter because it gives you resolving power, which I'll describe a little more in detail later. The larger your optic, the finer detail you can see, but more importantly, light collection capability to see fainter and fainter things. And that went on uh, you know, sort of untethered uh, up until we started getting up into 100-inch telescopes. And then finally, photography was invented, which was uh, putting silver nitrate on glass plates. Silver nitrate is a, a photosensitive material. And they could then expose, rather than just looking through the telescope, they could expose long time exposures, which would allow the image to build up over time while somebody was guiding the telescope. And that resulted in many orders of magnitude of increase and eventually electronic detectors. Uh, and then comes the big cheat, the Hubble Space Telescope. We got above the atmosphere uh, and we had sensitive electronic detectors. And it just blows away all the other telescopes. Now keep in mind, you know, that the Palomar telescope, the Soviet six meter telescope, you know, these are huge telescopes, almost 20 feet across. And the Hubble is a puny little 2.4 meter, 94 inch telescope. Um, but it totally transformed our view of the universe. And then with further servicing missions, this last one, uh, we were able to go up another order of magnitude. And so this has transformed our view of the universe and has really gotten us to the point where the questions of where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the chemical elements that we're made out of come from? Where did our solar system come from? What's the fate of our solar system, of the universe? And the question of are we alone in the universe, which I'll describe some more, uh, are now scientifically answerable questions with instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'll talk about, and future telescopes. Now, the reason why we could do all of this is because we had the space shuttle going up on five servicing missions to continuously improve the Hubble Space Telescope with new instruments, new capability. Uh, if you can imagine 1993, if you were to go to Walmart and ask for a digital camera, they'd look at you very funny. Uh, you know, nowadays you can go there and you can get 16, 24 megapixel cameras, uh, basically, you know, at, at the cost of what used to be a little Instamatic. And so the ability over time to put in the new instruments, especially on servicing mission four, where we did a complete makeover of the telescope, has allowed us to do these upgrades and keep uh, up with the advances in technology to allow us to explore deeper. But it's nevertheless a human enterprise. This is Scott Altman, he was the commander, and he's actually hand flying the space shuttle up underneath the Hubble. And Megan MacArthur had to reach out with a robotic arm and grab the Hubble. Uh, for Scott Altman, it was his fourth flight, his second flight up to Hubble. I flew with him in 2002 as well. Uh, for Megan MacArthur, it was her first time in space, first time operating the arm. Uh, and so she was under the pressure to reach out with this 50-foot-long robotic arm, grab a little pin on Hubble. If she missed, that would be the end of Hubble. And uh, so a fair amount of pressure. Oh, and did I mention that we don't have an arm in Houston to train on? All we have are simulators. Uh, so this was actually the first time that she flew the arm uh, and did a real grapple. Uh, so, but obviously she did great. We had the Hubble in tow. That allowed us to get uh, dressed up for spacewalking. Uh, this is Drew Feustel, my spacewalking partner, Scott Altman without a spacesuit. A uh, big hazard when you're in an airlock. One turn of the handle and poosh, out goes all the air. Uh, and, and myself in my spacesuit. And so we were able to go out on five spacewalks of approximately seven to eight hours duration and take out the old instruments, put in new ones, fix things. Uh, you know, I'm sure you can't tell, but that's me. I have the red stripe, that's Drew. Solar arrays, the Hubble mounted in the payload bay of the shuttle. That's the Earth, it looks so bright because it's overexposed. And we're orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. But of course for us, you know, everything is very calm and cool and collective and smooth. Um, you know, my experience has shown that just about anything you can do on the ground uh, you can do in space with sufficient training and great tools. This is actually from the 1999 flight. That's Claude Nicolier. You can see the Earth reflected in his visor. A little bit of the space shuttle. That's the orbital maneuvering engine. Uh, this is a container with some of the scientific instruments. And he has his favorite power tool with him. Uh, and, it, and it's the ability of humans to make tools, to make spacesuits, make space shuttles uh, that allows us to do all of that. 
So here's an example from uh, my helmet cam. Actually, this is Drew's helmet cam opening up the Hubble and taking out one of the old instruments and then uh, putting in a new one. So here he is taking out one of the old ones. Uh, in training, it always got stuck. So you saw him briefly give a thumbs up because he could let go of it in space, which you couldn't do uh, in, in training. Uh, we train in a big uh, water tank in Houston where we're neutrally buoyant. They put little weights on things so they don't float or sink. Uh, so now he's doing it in space. This was a repair of one of the cameras that had failed. And for the first time in space, we were taking panels off of instruments, taking tiny screws off. How do you take tiny screws out in space? With a tiny screwdriver. <laughs> but you don't want to lose any screws. And so we actually had a special plate we put on uh, to take them out with a new power tool. I love building new power tools. If you look carefully, you'll be able to see the screws floating around once I take this cover plate off. Uh, so there's some of those screws floating around. That exposed circuit boards. We'd never pulled circuit boards and put new boards in in space. Uh, so we built a tool to do that. The edges are too sharp to touch with a spacesuit glove because if they get cut, all the oxygen would leak out and I, I would die. So we built a tool to do that. So we, were, for the first time, showed that we could take out tiny screws, take out circuit boards, put new ones in. Uh, and basically do fine, these very fine motor skills uh, that you know, a number of people here on Earth, mostly policy people, said, no, it's too risky, we can't do it. But we were able to achieve that. There's the Baja Peninsula. You know, we're cleaning up for the day coming in. And we had trained for this and, and allotted many, many hours to do the repair. Um, but we predicted on the crew that we could do it in two and a half hours. And so to, to be able to do that, I trained over and over and over again here on planet Earth. Uh, and I was pretty happy because it took two hours and 32 minutes. Uh, so you can see me pretty happy, although I always look that happy in space, at least mo most of the time. But my wife is in the front row, so I have to say I'm sometimes that happy on, on Earth. Um, you know, we also had some pretty standard things where we would take out, you know, piano-sized instruments and put them in here. I'm riding on the end of that robotic arm. Megan is driving me around, uh, and so I'm just holding on to it, and she's actually you know, inserting the instrument in. Drew is the free floater here. Uh, so a, a wide variety of tasks that we were able to do. And then after five spacewalks, deploy the Hubble. This is one of the last views of the Hubble that anybody's uh, going to have, other than if we go back to Hubble someday. And this is the kind of view we have of planet Earth. The Hubble really is, like most of the science that's done in the world, basic research, about wonder and awe. And I think no more than uh, you know, any other field, but, but Hubble in particular, has exposed the beauty of the universe with now cameras that have the same kind of quality as our eyes. And that makes a difference. When you see a fuzzy blob and somebody tells you it's a galaxy you know, with 100 million stars or 100 billion stars, you know, you, you, your intellect turns on and you think, wow, that's cool. But when you see it in that kind of detail that we have with human eyes, you know, it makes a big difference. This is the Orion Nebula, if you think about the constellation Orion and the belt and the sword and the second star down in the sword, it's actually not a star. It's a whole star forming region where baby stars are being born. And this gas and dust is glowing in the light of the chemical elements that came out of the explosions of stars, uh, the stuff we're made out of. You know, the calcium in our bones, the iron in our blood, uh, the zinc that you're supposed to take if you're getting a cold that's critical for our immune system. All of that was created in the life cycle of stars. You know, we've been through about two and a half supernova to get the chemical elements that make up our bodies. And that process is being played out in these beautiful nebula where in the bright spots, baby stars are being born. And some of them very massive, may only live 10 million years and then explode in a giant supernova explosion. It's believed that our solar system started because of a nearby supernova, some bright young star listened to way too much rock and roll and, and blew up, uh, but caused our solar nebula to slowly collapse. And our star has been around for about 5 billion years and will live for many billion years more, a small, uninteresting, boring star, we hope. And, uh, and those stars are also being born here, and the material is coming from this nebula of gas and dust. Uh, other views, the Horsehead Nebula, you know, which so many of us have seen in a small telescope as a fuzzy little uh, divot inside of a long stream of gas and dust with a little imagination. And Hubble reveals it as this amazing structure with detail that you feel that you could fly through and it takes on a three-dimensionality. Uh, again, this is a little bit technical, but this is an image of uh, a nearby very bright star 
and Hubble has effectively put its thumb over the bright light to block out the star. And we see a ring of material around it. And buried within that ring, Hubble has observed a planet slowly marching in its long orbit. We've actually observed a planet around another star directly with the Hubble Space Telescope. Closer to home, this is uh, not a, a Hubble image, but a Ga Galileo image superimposed on a Hubble image showing plumes of water shooting out uh, from Europa, uh, which means that if we send a mission to Europa, we can sample that water. Underneath this icy crust is a 100 kilometer thick ocean, a warm, salty ocean. And if life is easy to start, it ought to be under this icy crust. And we have access to that through water shooting out in these giant plumes, these geysers, if you will. At the other end of the spectrum, this is one of the amazing Hubble Deep Fields. Uh, every object in this field is a galaxy with 50 billion, 100, 200 billion stars in it. Uh, so if you pick out any particular speck, you know, there's a speck right there. You know, that's a galaxy at some great distance. And Hubble has now set the distance record with this fuzzy blob, which is probably 20 to 50 billion stars. That's, we're seeing it because of the finite speed of light as it was when it was only 400 million years old. And this is about the limit of Hubble's view. And so these are some of the amazing things Hubble has done. But even though the universe you know, is vast uh, and the Hubble has only scratched the surface on what, we've, what we can see, we're reaching the limits of its ability to see back further uh, or to see things in more detail for a couple of different reasons, one of which is uh, it's just not a very big mirror. It's a small mirror. The mirror would fit on this stage. Uh, and the other is that light from these distant galaxies is redshifted because the universe is expanding. The light is getting stretched out with it. And so as you go further back, it's in the infrared where Hubble can't see. And so to see further back in the universe, or to see inside of dusty regions that Hubble just can't see because we need infrared light. We're building the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I won't go into a whole history, but you might wonder, well, who is James Webb? James Webb was the second administrator of NASA. He's a former director of the Office of Management and Budget. And you might think, well, why are we naming a telescope after you know, a budget guy? And the answer is James Webb put science into NASA, space science and earth science. He's the one that worked with uh, Vice President then President Johnson to make sure that science was an integral part and a well-funded part of NASA's activities and that it was integrated with the human spaceflight activities. And that's something that has served NASA very well. So going where no Hubble has gone before, it's going to be able to look further back in time than the, than the Hubble Space Telescope. It's going to be able to look at the assembly of galaxies through that gas and dust in those star-forming regions to see the baby stars as they form and to study planets and the origin of life. So the way we're building that is very fast. Uh, we have incredibly inspired workers. One of them is here in the audience, a new member. Um, this is the James Webb Space Telescope. And the people are there for scale and, and actually working um, as it's being you know, set up to be able to rotate it and do work on the other side. And it's built up with a series of smaller segments. Each segment is about a meter and a half across. Um, it's gold because it wants to reflect infrared light. Um, it has to be very precise. If you were to take one of those mirrors and stretch it to the size of the United States, the highest mountain would be about 10 inches tall, and the average mountain size is about 3 inches. You know, keep in mind, the Rockies are about 14,000 feet tall. Um, so this is the amazing James Webb Space Telescope. You can see it's much larger, and it was made much larger by this segmented approach. Instead of building one large, heavy mirror, it's gone to segments, and each segment is controllable. So you can move it, you can tilt it a little bit, you can pull on the middle to change it shape slightly, and that will allow it to be reshaped once we get to orbit to make sure it has the right figure uh, to be able to image clearly. Of course, you may remember the Hubble Space Telescope got to orbit, and its shape was perfect, except it was the wrong shape. So the images had what's called spherical aberration, and so the images were blurry, and we couldn't go up there and regrind the mirror. Although if I would have been around then, I would have volunteered. Um, but we had to put in corrective optics. So what we've done with James Webb is build that corrective optics in from the beginning. Now the other problem with that, though, is when you build a big telescope, how do you launch it? It's too big to fit in a rocket. So what we're going to do is fold it up like a transformer and origami. Um, so I'm going to show you a video, again, very fast workers, of the unfolding uh, and just a piece of the back plane. 
So this is the secondary structure. So the light comes in, bounces off a secondary into the primary, sorry, off the primary into a secondary and into a hole in the mirror. And so this is the structure that's going to have to be deployed once it gets to space. And it has to be done all automatically without people circling around or without me in a spacesuit or without anybody. So I'm going to show you a video of that deployment. I hope. Here we go. All right, so it's going to launch from French Guiana on an Ariane 5, all folded up like that. The solar ray is going to come out. The antenna is going to come out for communications. And next are going to come out these wings that have sunshades to keep the sun off the telescope. The telescope is going to be zipping out to a point a million miles from Earth. And that sunshade is going to block all of the sun from the primary mirror and all of the instruments. And it's going to slowly cool off to 40 degrees above absolute zero. And that allows it then to see the infrared light, which is very cold light. Uh, to do that, though, those wings have to deploy. Covers have to come off. Guy lines, little wires are going to start pulling on things to uh, deploy layers. Uh, there's five layers that are the insulating layers to protect it from the sun. So on one side, it'll be hundreds of degrees, and on the other side, 40 Kelvin. And all these commands have to work. There's hundreds of electromechanical operations that all have to be successful. Uh, and so now that that's occurring, the telescope will start cooling off as it zips out. That secondary will deploy, and then the wings of the telescope will deploy. And then it will be all assembled and ready for checkout. Uh, it'll be operated from the Space Telescope Science Institute up in Baltimore on the campus of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and scientists around the world, probably 10,000 scientists, will then be using this telescope for a nominal lifetime of, ten, of five years, hopefully 10 or 11 years lifetime. And, and after that, it'll kind of be abandoned in space. We'll operate it as long as we can. Now, this is the entirety of the James Webb Space Telescope servicing plans that I'm going to show you. Uh, this will take about the next 25 minutes. All right, well, that's it. There is none. So what's next after James Webb? So I want you to imagine the moment sometime in the next 10 years or the next 20 years when there's a press conference, you know, maybe it'll be the Philosophical Society of Washington, announcing the discovery of Earth 2.0 a planet that's orbiting a star maybe very much like ours, in an orbit very much like ours, on a rocky planet about the size of Earth uh, where we've detected atmospheric gases and properties where we can definitively say uh, it's a lot like home. I think that's going to be a tremendous moment. This is actually the Earth. It's taken from the Deep Space Climate Observatory satellite uh, that's between the Earth and the Sun, uh, taking images like this constantly uh, throughout the day. Now, what do I mean by Earth-like? Uh, we talk about habitable zone. You'll hear that a lot. Now, there's expanded habitable zone, narrow, but just to keep it simple, if you think of a planet that's too close to its host star, say like Venus, uh, it's probably too hot. And at some point during its life, it might have had all the water driven off. If you think of something like Mars today, currently, not past Mars, um, it's probably too cold to have surface water that's liquid. Um, and just in the right place where we are, you know, we can have surface water, which we, you know, many people believe is sort of the necessary solvent uh, for, or ingredient for life. Now, there's a lot of fuzz in that. You know, it depends on how much interior heat is there is, whether you have continental dynamics that might create a lot of heat, the components of the atmosphere. Uh, some people believe that increasing amounts of CO2 traps heat in the atmosphere. Other people believe that's a hoax. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, but we do know that Venus, which is predominantly a carbon dioxide atmosphere, traps lots of heat. So we've already seen some of these systems around a very dim red star, Kepler-186. It's a, a, a red dwarf. And so its habitable zone is much closer to the star because the star doesn't produce as much heat as our sun. And we've discovered a rocky planet uh, about the mass of Earth, Kepler-186f, that's just because A, B, C, D, E, F, we name all the planets as they go out. This one sits in the habitable zone. Uh, there's a star very much like our sun, a little bit older, and a planet a little bit more massive that lives the, near the inner edge 
Kepler 452, the second discovered planet, uh, in its habitable zone. And then for reference, here's our solar system. So we're starting to get there. But none of these are close enough to Earth to study with James Webb Space Telescope because Kepler was looking off in some part of the galaxy, mostly at stars much further away. So the question is, you know, what will it take to find that Earth 2.0 and to decide whether it really is an Earth twin? And the challenge is that an Earth 2.0 is going to be incredibly faint. How faint, you ask? Uh, fainter than the dimmest galaxy in that Hubble Deep Field that I showed you. I mean, it's, there's incredibly little reflected light coming off of one of those at any reasonable distance. Um, and we can say pretty definitively that there's none really close that you could see with binoculars. Um, because Alpha Centauri is the nearest star, it's about system about 4.2 light years. And between Alpha Centauri and Earth, there's nothing. So if you really want to find an Earth 2.0, you're probably going to have to look at a lot of planetary systems. This is uh, a plot of the diameter of a telescope. So Hubble is here at 2.4. James Webb is at 6.5. And, and this shows you the number of exo-Earth candidates that we think we can find and then study as a function of the diameter. Now, there's multiple curves on here, and there are assumptions that go into this. We have a lot of dust in our solar system. In the plane of the planets, there's a lot of dust. If you call that amount of dust a unit of one, well, we should be able to find lots of planets. But that may not be normal. Some of these planetary systems that we see with other observatories have lots of dust. If we have 60 times as much dust as we do in our solar system, you don't find as many planets because it's going to obscure those planets. If it's only three times, you get more of them. And so the question is, do you feel lucky? Right? If Earths are everywhere, then you don't need a very big telescope. You, know, you could probably look at 10 uh, solar systems with a four meter telescope and you might find an Earth. If Earths are relatively rare, you probably want to get up to about 100 Earths. You know, so now you're talking about something that's 16 to 20 meters. And so I'm going to argue that you know, we shouldn't just pretend that we're going to be lucky and design something too small. The next telescope ought to be big. And I think if we want to have dozens of rocky planets in that habitable zone, uh, with all of the astrophysical uncertainties uh, and Murphy's Law, uh, we ought to be bigger than 16 meters. The other reason we wanted to have a bigger telescope is what if we don't find an Earth, but we want to do great science, or we want to understand what are the ranges of Earths that might be out there? You know, things on the inner habitable zone, outer habitable zone, right in the middle, larger Earths, smaller Earths. You want a big sample to study. You know, if, if Darwin had gone to the Galapagos and just looked at one bird and come back and said he knows everything about the Galapagos, it simply wouldn't be true. So if we have a small telescope, a little bigger than James Webb, a little, I mean, a little smaller than James Webb, a little bigger than Hubble, you know, this is how the kind of Earth we'll be able to look at, a handful, maybe a dozen, Neptunes and Uranuses, about the same, and maybe three or four Jupiters. Not a very robust sample to understand how solar systems are formed. With a 16-meter telescope, you know, now we start to get hundreds in each category of hot and warm. Hot means close to its host star. You know, where it's probably not in the habitable zone. Warm would be you know, something you know, that we might want to live on, and cold is more of a Mars case. So you really want to have a robust sample. Now, once we find one, how are we going to know if anybody's home? Because that's the next step, not just knowing there's another place we could live, but is not anybody out there? So a quick show of hands. How many people think that life is extraordinarily rare, and we're probably not going to find life outside of planet Earth? And I don't mean intelligent life outside of the Beltway or inside the Beltway. This is, you know, this is, uh, you know, any life at all. Uh, first question. And that it's uh, that who, who thinks we will find life? Yeah, it seems compelling. And it's a scientific question we hope to be able to answer. So how do we answer that? Well, one way is to take a spectrum, break the light of the planet that's being reflected off by its host star and reaching Earth, break it into all of its component colors, and then look for characteristic dips and wiggles that tell you things, that tell you this line, that line, that line, those absorptions of light tell you that there's oxygen and ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, perhaps carbon dioxide, an indication of volcanic activity, or sulfur dioxide, or nitrogen dioxide. Methane, 
If you have methane and oxygen in the atmosphere, they compete against each other. You oxidize the methane, you get rid of it. So if there's methane, there has to be a source of methane. If you just have methane or no oxygen, it could be coming out of the volcanoes, out of geophysical processes. But if you have methane and oxygen, there's something weird going on. You may see the blue sky. You may see water vapor. Hopefully you see water vapor. If you see water vapor in the atmosphere, it means there's probably water on the surface. So these are the kind of things that the science will tell us that might be there. Now there's, you know, the hitting the jackpot is seeing indications of chlorophyll. Now the expectation that, you know, the same kind of molecules would be created to change sunlight into energy, a little bit fanciful, but there may be other organic markers for whatever kind of life is there. So this is, you know, the tool of the trait. We draw this cartoon because it makes sense to us as scientists. The reality is, you know, here's one of the better spectra we've been able to get out of a planet. This happens to be a hot Jupiter, and these dots are the spectrum. The blue and the red are the models. So if you were to take that away and you'd say, well, it's not really convincing you see anything as far as absorption. You know, we numerically compute that it makes sense, but you, other than, you know, this feature here, you know, it's not really clear. So we're just, at the, and this is with Hubble, you know, so it's a small mirror. If you said that's what all hot Jupiters look like, it happened to be a big hot Jupiter, you'd be wrong. Uh, we've now looked at you know, a dozen of these, and everyone looks totally different. We don't even understand simple gas giants like Jupiter, so how do we expect to understand something like an Earth or another Earth? So the answer is we ought to have a big sample. And Joe, just to make it graphic, if we had a four-meter telescope, we'd be able to look at 21 different stars and who knows what kind of planets they have, because we know where all the stars are. We know what the address, the location of all of these are, so we can figure it out. A four meter, we get 21 stars. This is an actual map. If we go to 20 meter, now we get 1,800 stars. You know, that's what it takes to be able to interrogate and get a spectrum of those planets that we have yet to find, but they're out there. Kepler has told us that virtually every star in the night sky has a solar system around it. All right, so. Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So I say extraordinary claims require extraordinary apertures, size of telescopes. So 200 hour observation of an Earth at 10 parsecs, that's about 30 light years away. With a four meter telescope, you get this wiggly stuff. I, you know, I'm not a spectroscopist, but it just looks like a wiggly line. The other problem is with a small telescope, you end up only being able to go out uh, to about one micron if you want to try and catch the optical spectrum. If you have a 16 meter telescope, suddenly all these spectral lines come into focus, like that previous cartoon, and you can go out to two or three microns. And there are various reasons why that I'll explain. So you really want to go big. Uh, so here's the reason. The resolving power of a telescope is a function of the wavelength you look at and the size of the telescope. The bigger the telescope, the smaller things that you can see on the sky. And that's because light diffracts. Um, and so this is the diffraction limit. If we're looking at a star that's 30 light years away, 10 parsecs away, here's the bright star. The planet is orbiting, say at one astronomical unit. That's the distance our planet is from our sun. You need to be able to resolve the star away from the planet and then block out the starlight. If you don't have a very big telescope, you can't differentiate between the two. You don't have the power to resolve it, the accuracy. And so this is called an inner working angle, but it shows the angle at which you can resolve as a function of the wavelength divided by the aperture. So the aperture is fixed at four meters. As you go up in wavelength, this is going to get worse and worse because lambda is going to increase. So it's twice as bad at one micron than it is at half a micron. Half a micron is the middle of our visible spectrum. So as you go up towards this crucial oxygen feature and the water feature, suddenly you can't see the planet anymore. So that's a problem. If you go to a 16 meter telescope, we can do the same thing. And you can see that even as it starts marching up, you go by these interesting features, the oxygen feature, the water features, the carbon dioxide features, methane. 
And it takes, you know, you're way off the scale at three microns before the planet isn't visible anymore. So you need a big telescope. Now you could do it with interferometers and other things, but that's a little hard. So getting back to extraordinary claims require extraordinary apertures. If, if oxygen alone were our biosignature, would you believe that or this? You know, that's one data point at low resolution or something that, you know, really resolves. And so that's the key. And my message is simply that if we were to see this, if we were to spend billions of dollars, which is what these telescopes cost, and we see this, everybody would scratch their heads and say, ah, now we need to build the bigger telescope. And it may or may not happen you know, while we're alive. So if you really want to know the answer, you want to see this. And so what will it take? Uh, well, you know, just the comparison is 4 meter or 16 meter. You know, the cost difference is sort of irrelevant. We're asking about finding out if we're alone in the universe, if there's another Earth out there. And the telescope aperture, the optics, is typically only 15% of the overall project cost, roughly speaking. Now, there are various scaling, um, but it's compelling that we build bigger. You know, I've said this a few times. With a 4-meter, we can get about a dozen. With 16-meter, hundreds of exoplanets. But there's more you can do. It's like the Ginsu knives. If you have a large enough telescope, you can actually start to observe in shorter exposures. Um, this is the uh, imagery from the epoxy comet spacecraft. Now, we're never going to be able to get, at least in a reasonable time frame, images like this of an exoplanet. They're always just going to be a dot of light. But you can analyze the variations in the colors and the brightness of a planet as you watch it and figure out what the distribution of continents and oceans and clouds and, and ice caps and weather. And so this is what they actually did with that spacecraft, is they watched the brightness in various colors. So here's, uh, actually this is infrared, red, green, and blue, each of these curves. And you can see as the Earth rotates, because sometimes there's more ocean, sometimes there's more continents, you know, and it varies over seasons, you can watch that planet. And from that, they were able to build a map of the Earth, a crude map, that's longitude only as it rotates, and they pretty much get the distribution of continents and oceans correct. And my geologist friends tell me, if you see a distribution like this of continents and oceans, it means the planet has plate tectonics. You don't get that continent and ocean distribution unless you have things moving around. And if you have plate tectonics, you probably have undersea ridges, which are where we think one, one place where life might have started on Earth, are these undersea vents. Um, so it's really amazing that you know, we can you know, build that. But to do that, if you have a four meter telescope, you have to observe uh, for a couple of days to get enough light, just a bit, you know, how much light can you collect. And so it washes over this effect. You won't be able to build a map. With an eight meter telescope, you have enough resolution to put a few elements, uh, 12 meter or 16 meter. Now you can really study this in detail. And by looking at the colors, you may also be able to discern between, if it's there, crust, brown, and green, plants. We might even be able to figure out if there's plants on a planet and see seasonal changes on the continents. You know, that would be pretty compelling. So for the first time in human history, we have the technology to answer those questions. You know, with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're learning a lot. We're learning how to build these segments. We can build them now out of glass and replicate them very fast. It took us a long time to learn how to build the James Webb segments uh, that I talked about stretching to the size of the US and its roughness uh, is only a few inches. In fact, there are bacteria on the surface of the mirror. There are bacteria everywhere on Earth. They fall. You know, people scratch their head going, what's that? And you know, suddenly there's stuff on the mirror. Those bacteria are bigger than anything else on the mirror. They dominate. Um, and they'll probably survive space. But now we can build mirrors out of uh, glass, out of carbon fiber, out of uh, various nanolaminates, composites, where we can build them faster and less expensive, uh, and we can control their shape a lot better. So I propose, and, and, and several others are proposing, that we build a much bigger telescope out of segments. And actually, if you look at that center section, the one where I showed James Webb Space Telescope deploying, and all those tiny little people moving around so fast, uh, you could use that and build up just one section like that on Earth, a tessellation, integrate these, and carry these bits up to space, 
and then have people like me, as we did on Hubble, stick them all together to build a much larger mirror. And so if we were to do that, following along the James Webb Space Telescope concept, we might be able to build something that has a very large sunshade and you know, a 30 meter telescope even. Uh, another view, this is you know, using similar technology to James Webb. Uh, we could also uh, build a telescope that looks more like Hubble with a sunshade that's a tunnel uh, with a combination of robotic deployment of trusses. And here's the Orion capsule. This is a small habitat. Uh, turns out this isn't needed. You could just do it with this, but you got to carry the parts up somewhere. Here's the spacecraft with the uh, solar arrays, and here's a robotic arm uh, holding one of those tessellated panels, and to scale, uh, me, or somebody like me, um, or one of those tiny little James Webb person running around, but on the end of a robotic arm, putting them in place. And the advantage of these segments is that once you get them up there, if it's not the perfect shape, uh, you can either command an adjustment or somebody could go up with one of those power tools you know, and get it all registered uh, before they leave so that it's close and then you back off and finish it off. Uh, here's another view. This one somebody liked probably from Lockheed Martin that builds the Orion capsule. Two Orion capsules if one is good. But it gives you sort of a, a sense of the scale. This is very much in our experience base. This is what we've been doing. Uh, one, one final one that shows a canister finally. Uh, that contains the pieces that you bring up. You know, by various estimates, an enormous fraction of the cost of an overall observatory like James Webb, like Hubble, is the mechanical engineering team that has to design the mission to survive launch loads. That's the most violent thing that a spacecraft sees. Once it gets to space, it's you know, happy, it's quiet, it's peaceful. It has a big smile on its face like me. Um, but to engineer it to get up there is hard. In fact, James Webb Space Telescope is going through vibration testing now. And when we did the first you know, vibration test, there was a loud noise and everybody panicked. Well, I wouldn't say panicked. We got freaked out because we thought we'd broken it. It was designed to survive this, but we heard something we didn't expect. We thought it would sail through the test. Well, that's why we test. And it's since been you know, exonerated that we understand what it is. Um, but it's really hard to get anything. And I can tell you, having sat on the rocket five times, it is not a peaceful event. It is a very violent event. On my second mission, um, I was the flight engineer, and the vibration was so high, my eyeballs were shaking in the socket, and I couldn't read any of the displays for about five seconds. And then the resonance passed, and it was just generally violent, not specifically violent. Um, <laughs> but if you could take the pieces up, cushioned, stored together nicely, you wouldn't have to do all that engineering. Uh, you just put them up you know, a nice soft ride with, you know, those little vacuum bags, you know, little airbags between them. Uh, so you could get them up there and then assemble them. So this structure would have to be much lighter. The engineers wouldn't be spending all their time trying to figure out how this lightweight structure could hold those mirrors. So it's an enormous savings in engineering. For the first time in human history, we also have the launch vehicles that can launch something of that kind of scale. And that's the space launch system. That's shown here with Orion on it but there's a version that you'll see that has a fairing. Uh, this is a very big rocket. This is comparable to the uh, Apo Saturn V Apollo missions or the space shuttle. In fact, it's space shuttle heritage. These are solid rocket motors from space shuttle and an external tank from space shuttle. Uh, all the missions disappeared. I wonder what that means. Maybe this is a po policy statement. I don't know. <laughs> They're supposed to be, whoops, supposed to be missions there. Okay. Um, so Orion fits in there. There is supposed to be a telescope uh, there and a fairing for Mars. It's not on my screen either. But here you go. So here's what it would look like with a payload fairing, and inside are all the bits you would need to take to a telescope. You'd meet up with it with an Orion spacecraft, grab it, probably in a, in a very large elliptical orbit uh, around the Earth that, that's pretty close to the moon, because when you finish it, it's going to give a little puff out of its engine and sail out to where James Webb is. Uh, here's a notion of stacking those segments, various pieces, solar arrays, uh, you know, the, the spacecraft bus. In this one, it's not using SLS. It would be three flights of a heavy lift um, if you didn't want to use an SLS. So here's some of the reasons why you would do that. It's the most direct way to study an Earth-sized rocky planet in detail, in fact, the only way. Uh, it's inherently serviceable, 
So for, with a little puff of its rocket, you could bring it back from that million miles away from the Earth into a high orbit, change the instruments out again to keep it state of the art. And so you leverage that investment the same way, way we have over the last 26 and a half years with Hubble. Uh, lower mass, limiting the, eliminating the launch load survival concerns, potentially lower cost, almost certainly lower cost, as long as you can ignore the cost of the big rocket, of the capsule, of the training of the people and all that infrastructure. But we're doing that anyway because we have a human spaceflight program. And I would argue that you know, this is you know, really a meaningful and important thing to do with our human spaceflight program. Uh, and it makes the best use, as I just said, of the billions, you know, I said billion, but it's tens or hundreds of billions of investment in our human spaceflight infrastructure. Okay, so I've told a nice story. Uh, and you could take my word for it that we really do have the experience between the Hubble Space Telescope, between the James Webb Space Telescope, but do we really know how to build big things in space? Well, hopefully you've been paying attention. You know, we've built this 100 meter across, you know, very complex international space station that was much harder to build than it would be to build a 30 meter telescope in space. Uh, and, and we've learned an enormous amount from doing that. That may be the greatest achievement of the International Space Station is just being able, especially with all of our international partners, to get it all together and to operate it. However, this is not for the faint of heart. Hubble certainly was not for the faint of heart. It was a very big, risky endeavor when it was started. And there were probably, you know, we could go through the records, probably somebody from Hubble before launch was talking about how audacious it is to launch a space telescope. Lyman Spitzer, uh, an astronomer at Princeton proposed it in 1946 when he saw the V2 rockets being launched. Uh, no one could imagine how productive it is uh, today, back then. The James Webb Space Telescope, when it was proposed, extremely audacious. I think it's audacious today. Uh, there are people in the audience who are working on it who would agree with that. Um, and no, nobody can go there, but for scale, uh, there you are. This is equally as audacious, but I think is equally as achievable. Um, but we do have to be bold. What new wonders, undreamt of in our time, will we have wrought in another generation? And another. How far will our nomadic species have wandered by the end of the next century and the next millennium? Our remote descendants, safely arrayed on many worlds through the solar system and beyond, will be unified by their common heritage, by their regard for their home planet, and by the knowledge that whatever other life may be, the only humans in all the universe come from Earth. They will gaze up and strain to find the blue dot in their skies. They will marvel at how vulnerable the repository of all our potential once was, how perilous our infancy, how humble our beginnings, how many rivers we had to cross before we found our way. And so imagine the moment. Uh, as Carl Sagan says, when, when we find another blue dot and we realize you know, that there's something there, that there may be somebody there. Uh, if, if there's intelligent life on a planet 10 parsecs away, 30 light years away, and they have already built this telescope, they know we're here. They see in our atmosphere all the signs of an industrial civilization, of life on Earth, and they will have been able to watch you know, for whatever duration that telescope has been up, the evolution of our atmosphere. But to create that moment, to create, you know, the ability, and I think the inevitability of finding life beyond planet Earth, uh, we need to be ambitious. So with that, uh, I think we have time for questions. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. So we do have uh, guys with microphones, and the procedure is if you'll put your hand in the air long enough for them to see you, eventually a microphone will come to you. But if you put your hand up and put your hand down and they don't see you, then the microphone won't come to you. But when you have the mic, please stand up, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member or you're not, and 
ask a question. And if you'd like to become a member. Well, I'm, I'm Joseph Powers and I'm not a member, but I, I had a question. Um, I, I saw the talk about the, uh, the New Horizons mission to Pluto and I was disappointed to find that the uh, plutonium battery is gonna run out at, uh, I would guess at about 140 AU out. So I was wondering about the possibility of a, a space telescope out to 547 or 48 AU where you point it at the sun and you use general relativity to lens an image of whatever's on the opposite bearing and also about the possibility of telescopes on the moon. So your talk didn't really talk about the, the difference between zero gravity and just less than earth gravity for building these big mirrors. So I wonder if you could say something about those two possibilities for space telescopes. People have talked a lot about uh, using the sun and you know, the lensing effect, gravity, you know, the curvature of space time as a lens, uh, and astronomy on the moon. Uh, there is some astronomy that would be useful on the moon, radio astronomy on the far side, because it blocks all of the terrestrial radiation. I mean, we are, we are filling near space uh, with a lot of noise, radio noise. Uh, not so much broadcasting out to you know, other, other stars that would hear us anymore, but at least local radio noise, all the cell traffic and communication traffic, so that if we want to do astronomy in certain bands, it cannot be done from the Earth anymore, especially low frequencies, hundreds of kilohertz. You'd have to go to something, and the moon is a good blocker. But that's a very, very, very narrow field of astronomy. To put astronomical telescopes one of, you know, is, is something that's for probably the last 10 to 20 years been realized that the moon is just a lousy place to put an observatory uh, for a number of reasons. One of which is you still have the gravity gradient problem of you know, the mirror wanting to sag. It's a third the problem it is, sorry, a sixth the problem it is here on Earth, but it's still a problem. And you have transport of dust uh, that is carrying potentially water around the moon, in fact, and trained in mineral grains. Uh, you have problems of, you know, depending upon where you put it, for two weeks at a time, the sun is shining. That doesn't bode well for, for astronomy. Uh, and it's very hard to get stuff down to the surface. You know, it's a gravity well, so it's very expensive. Whereas in, uh, mic in microgravity, essentially floating in space, you have the perfect stability for a telescope. You have thermal stability, which is equally as crucial. Uh, and that's why we're sending things out a million miles from Earth, is get away from the Earth, which is warm. Get away from the moon. Things that cause the temperature to vary. Once you get your telescope set up, you want the temperature to stay rock solid. So the thermal expansion and contraction don't cause your image to, to wobble. And so it's, it's less expensive, it's easier, it's better not to be on the moon. Now the advantage on the moon someday will be you might have people there uh, as we do on mountaintops to fix things. Um, but as I mentioned, it's relatively easy. It takes a couple of months, but it's relatively easy to bring your telescope back, fix it in the vicinity of the Earth and send it back out. Uh, as far as a gravitational lens, you know, I was trying to focus, pun intended, on you know, the next 15 to 20 years. That's, that would be much longer. And you'd have to have a source other than plutonium. Just, and you know, there are other uh, fissile materials that have longer half-lives that you could use uh, or other technologies. Question over here, if somebody will bring in the mic. Anybody have a question? Please raise your hand for a little bit. Hi, Carl Merrill, a member. You mentioned moving the telescope in and out. So why didn't they design the James Webb telescope to do that? Then we could repair it and could have done a lot of other things with it. Uh, when I left uh, NASA in 2010 to become Deputy Director at Space Telescope Science Institute, which is going to be running the James Webb, I was absolutely determined that we have a little bit of serviceability on it, just enough to at least grab it in case something goes wrong, maybe give it a little shake. Uh, and, and I was unsuccessful in advocating from the outside that it should have this capability. Uh, then two years later, the NASA administrator said, John, will you come and run all of NASA science? And I thought, great, now I'll be in charge of James Webb. It'll just take the snap of my fingers, and I still couldn't do it. So, so the answer is, uh, there's a, there was a big fear that if we added the ability to grab James Webb, add the ability, say, to refuel it, 
that there would be requirements creep and suddenly somebody would ask at a PSW meeting, well, if you can grab it and refuel it, how about changing an instrument? And suddenly the cost would balloon out of control and the cost already is a big issue. Uh, the amazing story of James Webb, after it's launched, after it's, it's on station and doing incredible astronomy, somebody's gonna write the amazing story of James Webb, which is in 2012, we redid all of the program and project plans and then from then to launch, we actually performed on budget, on schedule, you know, which is incredible for something this complex. How do you do, Peter Kessler? I'm not a member, looking forward to being a member. Uh, wanted to ask a, really a non-science question. What can we do as citizens to assure or, to not, or, or encourage the next generation beyond uh, the Webb Space Telescope? So. Well, I think uh, my, you know, come to meetings like this, become, in, you know, enthused by the science. And then uh, as, you know, any citizens, we ought to express our interest to our elected officials. Because in the end, uh, it's Congress that writes the laws that funds the federal government these are very large investments, unlikely to be made by uh, even uh, billionaire, you know, tech, uh, you know, investors and, and innovators. It's still out of reach for, for those folks. You know, there's some that could could do this and not notice, but not very many. And it, and it's risky. You know, you're putting you're you're spending. You know, James Webb uh, life cycle cost is about eight eight point eight billion dollars, and it could all go up in flames on the launch pad. And a lot of investors don't like that idea. Uh, it's kind of binary. Um, some do. Uh, some in, invest in things like that. But, uh, but it, right now it's our federal government. And it's the, the consistent mantra, I think, is invest in basic research. Invest in basic research in microbiology, in astronomy, uh, in physics, in, in uh, you know, material science. Because the things we learn about our universe at the micro, at the macro, in our brains, in our bodies, you know, spurs on, you know, all kinds of developments. And this is really uh, the message that came uh, in the United States out of World War II when President Roosevelt chartered Vannevar Bush to write, to study how do we take advantage of these investments that helped us win World War II to advance our economy, to advance human health, to advance national security. And that has played very well for us in the United States ever since. Uh, if you haven't read uh, The Endless Frontier, help charter the National Science Foundation's efforts uh, and NASA indirectly. Uh, it's, it's a good read. John Rumble, member. Is it possible to build this and launch it over decades? You talked about doing it in sections, but to view this as a, a century-long project that eventually has you know, the full size, uh, thereby reducing costs and perhaps, you know, uh, avoiding problems with the rockets blowing up or at least minimizing that? I think actually if cost is, if lowering cost is the objective, you want to build it as fast as you possibly can. Because the longer it takes, the longer you have to keep hundreds of specialized engineers and technicians on staff, the longer you have to keep tooling available. Um, but also, you know, I think you know, it probably only takes about four to five years, if you, know, if you already know what you want to build, to build all these pieces. Uh, and as I told you, the, there was a spacewalk that it was predicted it would take two days to do, uh, you know, many hours, and I predicted it would take two hours and 30 minutes, and that's what I trained uh, doing, and it took two hours and 32 minutes. Um, I think it would only take about a week of spacewalks, of two teams going out every day, uh, sorry, a team going out every other day, so two teams working, uh, about two weeks to assemble a telescope and get it all finished up. Uh, it's not a big task. You know, it's, it's you know, repetitive, it's robotics, it's what's putting astronauts out of work already. Sir, uh, Jim McCormick, and I'm a member. Um, could you expand a little more on the relative merits of a manned assembly versus fully robotic? Sure. Uh, you know, one of which is that I think to build something that's much larger than you can fold up in a fairing. And a number of people have done studies in existing, so the fairing is the aero uh, shield that holds the payload 
when it launches through the atmosphere. Once you're out of the atmosphere, you blow that off. But you got to be able to fold up inside of that. And that was that, you know, the James Webb folding the wings in and folding the panels up and rolling it all up. Uh, the, about the biggest thing that we can build where it, it simply deploys is about 12 meters across. And that's right at the cusp of where it's interesting. Um, you know, if we find a, a planet really close that we can study, we might get lucky. But if we don't, the numbers are small and its resolution because of its diameter is pretty small. And so my feeling is if we were to launch a 12 meter robotic, we're in that case where we're gonna see something that looks really intriguing and we're gonna say, I wish we'd put one more ring of mirrors around the outside, but it just didn't fit. So now we have to build a whole new telescope. Um, so it's the ability to build sort of arbitrarily large uh, structures relatively straightforward. Now you could design a mission where there's robot arms and even from planet Earth, you know, you could have somebody controlling it. Uh, and so it would still be human assembly. The humans just wouldn't be on site. On the other hand, we're investing $4 billion a year to build a capsule and a, and a rocket to send people to go around the Earth and the moon over and over. Uh, right now, NASA has about 10 flights on the books and they don't do anything. I'm being mean, I'll admit to being mean, but right now it's, well, we're building the rocket, we're building the capsule, we have to fly at a certain rate or it's not even safe. So we need to fly at a cadence where people are practiced. And we're trying to sort of figure out what to do. So that infrastructure is already there. And we know that people can build things really well in space. And so we're taking advantage of the human on site to solve all the problems, the things that stick, to make the alignments. And that is a vast simplification of the mechanics of, of building a big telescope, is having those people on site. Now there's some things uh, like the deployment of the light shade that might be very fragile, you know, that you would design just so that it's, it's, you know, launched, you know, the crew would bolt it on, and then after the crew is left and the spacecraft that has, you know, the, the jets and stuff, little rockets, uh, then you would command it and little motors would crank it out. Of course, if it gets stuck, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to call back and say, hey, can, can you make a service call? Uh, and then the other is, which again, could be robotic or human, but the ability to launch things in a way that you don't have to design for launch loads of, of structures that are optical benches. So an optical bench means you put your mirrors on this structure and everything has to be adjusted you know, to nanometers, to tiny fractions of a meter with no distortion. And then be shaking the bejesus out of it during launch. Well, if you don't have to do that, uh, you can save an enormous amount of cost uh, and risk. So those are some of the reasons. I also think in the end, excluding the cost of the people and the rocket, uh, it'll just cost a lot less. Which also means it happens sooner. Al? Um, my name is Al Ehrlich, I am a member. I remember a very long time ago, people used to talk about the potential problems in assembling things in space and other things of cold welding. I, wonder, I haven't heard about that very recently. I wondered if the problem had been solved, that there was no problem. And contrawise, if anything, if cold welding could be used advantageously to help assemble things in space. Thank you. So cold welding is a really interesting uh, solid state metal effect. That if you have really pristine, incredibly flat surfaces, and you just push them together with a little pressure, all those electrons and all those nuclei are gonna see metal that looks just like each other. It has to be similar metals and it'll just completely bond to itself. And, and in practice, things aren't perfectly smooth. So you apply a little pressure. And so in a vacuum, two pristine metals, in fact, will pretty easily weld themselves together with pressure. You don't need heat, you don't need a flame. Uh, that's cold welding. In practice, Almost everything we sent into space has been coated by something. Uh, so some protective coating. Uh, pure aluminum, if it's on Earth, oxidizes very quickly, as do most metals. And so in practice, almost all things that we send to space either deliberately are coated to protect them from atomic oxygen degrading their surface, from ultraviolet light degrading their surface, they're either painted or anodized, uh, or you know, the, the native oxidation and so we really don't see cold welding uh, happening in practice. And that's something on 
those Hubble repairs we worried a lot about because the, everything was assembled in a clean room and we have these screws and they're steel, stainless steel screws in stainless steel inserts. Uh, but, you know, we've really seen no evidence of that. Yeah. To, to take advantage of it uh, is challenging because you have to keep those surfaces incredibly pristine. Uh, and, yeah, to get before you get to space, yeah. Well, you might be able to, yeah. The, the Ukrainians actually spend a lot of time thinking about welding in space. It's a pastime of theirs. Any other questions? Well, the Bob will have the last question then. It has to be a question though, Bob. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, what can be done with the various generations of these working together, of Hubble with James Webb and after James Webb? That's a great question. One of the uh, challenges that we had before the last servicing mission is that we you know, believed that we could probably only extend, well, at least the crew warranty was five years, uh, transportation not included, uh, and it's lasted much longer than that. In fact, Hubble is in the best shape of its of its life right now. Uh, part of that is the solar cycle. You know, our sun goes through a 22-year solar cycle, actually 11-year solar cycle or 22, depending upon how you look at it. And it gets active, and when it's active, it heats up our atmosphere, our atmosphere swells up, and satellites that are orbiting even as high as Hubble slowly spiral in from air drag, and the more air there is, the more they drag in. Well, as many of you know, and, and maybe the topic of a future PSW meeting, our sun has just been incredibly quiet. It's asleep, and that's a good thing. So Hubble has stayed up higher than we thought, so it's not spiraling down. Uh, so when we did the last service emission, we thought by you know, 2022 or three, it might be low enough in the atmosphere that it's not good for astronomy anymore. That's now, the, the models show out in the 2030s. So Hubble will last as long as it has instruments and you know, uh, gyroscopes and solar arrays and communications uh, that keep it working. And so we're looking now at this amazing opportunity that we'll have, hopefully, Hubble on orbit and James Webb on orbit. So going from ultraviolet to the mid-infrared in space and at the same time on the ground, we'll have these big 30-meter telescopes and the um, ALMA Atacama millimeter array radio telescopes and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, you know, the 2020s are going to be the golden age of astronomy by far uh, because we have that overlap. But at some point Hubble will roll off, at some point James Webb will roll off. And so it's even more important that today, I think, we start working on the next generation telescope because typically it takes 15 to 20 years once you start to build one of these from, you know, getting the approval from Congress, getting the designs, uh, various NASA administrators coming and going and deciding it's important or not, you know, other, other, other things, presidents, uh, administrations. Uh, so, it, you know, Hubble took about 20 years, James Webb will have taken about 20 years, uh, Spitzer Telescope, you know, about 15, Chandra about the same, X-ray, infrared. So that's about how long it takes for these projects. So better start now. You all game? Yeah. Thank you. So in appreciation for your talk, I want to present you with this framed copy of an announcement of the announcement of your lecture. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So just a few uh, <clears throat> house gaming announcements before we adjourn to the social hour. PSW depends on an enthusiastic, active, and capable membership. So if you're not a member, please join. And if you are a member, please get involved in helping carry out PSW activities. And if any of you out there are expert at live streaming video, please see me immediately after we adjourn to the social hour. Is anybody out there knowledgeable about streaming? Raise your hand. No one. Well. If you know anybody. <laughs> In order to become a member, it really isn't very hard, but there is one confusing thing. So if you go to our website at 
www.pswscience.org. And then you go to, up oh, membership, and you push the membership button, you'll pull up the application for membership. Surprise. If you go way down to the bottom, you'll find this, dues payment. If you're not elected, your dues payment will be refunded. Remember, this prevents us from running after you after you are elected to pay. And if you push the submit button, this is where people get in trouble because they get this screen. Notice it says PayPal and PayPal and PayPal and PayPal and PayPal and PayPal. And everybody thinks, logically, that you have to use PayPal. But you don't. This is sort of an, an advertising trap by PayPal. And if you go down here, and there's a little thing that says continue, continue, and it has the logos for your familiar credit cards, and you push on this link, you will get this screen, which is your standard pay by credit card screen. Now you might want to know why do we have the PayPal thing up there in the first place. It's not because we love Peter Thiel. He doesn't own PayPal anymore. It's, it's because PayPal gives very, very good rates to nonprofits. And they are simply serving as our merchant account. So we, you always have to have somebody who processes credit card and debit card payments. And in order to do that, you have to contract to have a merchant account. And they take a little cut of every single payment that's made. And PayPal's cut is very low. And that's why you have to go through all this PayPal nonsense in order to get to the page where you can pay with your regular credit card. So if you're not a member and you've been de deterred from becoming a member because you couldn't figure out how to pay using the credit card of your choice, hopefully now you'll be able to do that. Just remember, for those of you who are members, your dues payments were due. So if you haven't paid yet, please pay. Please keep in mind that PSW is a nonprofit educational organization. It is tax exempt under Section 501c3 of the beloved Internal Revenue Code, and contributions are tax deductible. PSW has a meetup group. It's the largest general science meetup group in the DC area. We have over 1,000 members, and we're still growing. Uh, while the meetup page has only a portion of the information on the PSW website, it's another way to connect with people in this area who are interested in science. But keep in mind, joining the meetup group does not make you a member of PSW. So if you want to join PSW, go back to our web page and proceed through this very difficult matrix and pay your dues and become a member. Our next speaker will be another space guy, Brett Alexander, Vice President at Blue Origin. He will be speaking on the new space age and specifically on new rocket engines and launch systems being developed by companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX and the space launch system that John mentioned tonight. We hope to see you then for what promises to be a very informative lecture. The rest of the spring schedule is as follows. Uh, we have Reed Beeman, Program Director in the Division of Biological Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation on the 24th of March, and he'll be speaking on the richness of biological elections and digital access. Then we have Eric Lindstrom, a program scientist, physical oceanography and the Earth Science Division of the NASA Science Mission Directorate, and he'll be talking basically on the use of remote sensing satellites to understand the ocean. And on the April 28th, we have Anthony James, who is a mosquito expert and a molecular biologist at UC Irvine. And he will be speaking on mosquitoes, synthetic biology, CRISPR, gene drive, and malaria. So please check the website at regular intervals for updates. The social hour ends at 10.30, after which PSW members and guests meet across the street at the Fairfax Hotel Lounge, formerly known as the Jockey Club. If you want to join us, please speak with corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor or Vice President Lloyd Mitchell, who can also help you with any questions you have about membership. 
please use side entrances to exit the building. And I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2,373rd meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. And second? All in favor? All opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the Social Hour.